thank you so much for being here. My name is Mike Haddad. I am the director of the production, and tonight I will be playing the role of Henry Percy. We are the world's stage players, a troupe affiliated with the Concord Players, whose main objective is to bring to life the words and the world of William Shakespeare every summer. Before we begin, we'd like to say a, a few thank yous to get us rolling. First of all, we want to thank the Concord Players for their continued partnership with us, and we hope that you will all come back this fall to see their season opener of The Play That Goes Wrong right here in 51 Walden. We want to thank the Concord Library. While we are performing here in 51 Walden tonight, uh, over the last decade, the Concord Public Library has provided our venue very graciously, and over the years have proved themselves time and again to be a great ally and friend to this organization. We want to do a shout out to our neighbors across the way, the Tricon Church, who uh, helped us out of a jam during our production week. <laughs> All of the music and the sound that you're going to be hearing in tonight's show was composed, arranged, and orchestrated by Catherine Denny. The sound was engineered by Bryce Denny, and the, the, the vocals that you will hear in the song are from the Labyrinth Choir. Due to an unfortunate oversight, they did not, the music information did not end up in the paper version of the program, but on the online version of the program, all of that information is there and available if you want to check that out. If you go to the Concord Players website, you can find a link to the World of Stage Players website, and there you will find our online program. You will find information about upcoming programs and shows and how to get in contact with us if you want any further information or you want to come play with us sometime. <laughs> this is our 11th production. And that leads me to our last thank you. We want to thank you, our audience, because year after year, it's through your support that we get to keep coming back and doing this thing that we love to do. And let's be honest, if it wasn't for you, all of our work and our effort would be for nothing. You provide us with meaning, and we love you for it. Thank you so much for being here. This production is Richard II. Chronologically, it is the first in a series of historical dramas that Shakespeare wrote, chronicling the reign of several English monarchs and how the crown changed hands, or heads in some cases. <laughs> The struggle for power, acts of betrayal, ends justifying the means. These themes found in all of these history, history plays of Shakespeare, they provided a map that have guided many modern movies and TV shows, be you in Westeros or the White House. Over the next few years, we hope to continue to unfold the story of these Richards and Henrys. Once again, we thank you for being here, and we sincerely hope you enjoy the World of Stage Players production of Richard II. Happy birthday. Old John of Gaunt. Time honored, Lancaster. Hast thou, according to thy oath and ban, brought hither Henry Hare for thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal which then our leisure would not let us hear against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Then call him to our presence. Face to face and frowning, brow to brow, ourselves shall hear the accuser and accused freely speak. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, let heaven be the record unto my speech. In the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince and free from other misbegotten hate, I come appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee. And mark my greeting, for what I speak, I will make good upon this earth, or my soul will answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live. Once more, the more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat, and wish, so please my sovereign, ere I move, 
These words I speak my right drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. The bitter clamor of two eager tongues can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot, thou must be cooled for this. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast as to be hushed and not at all to say, first, the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from my giving me reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would have post until it have returned. These terms of treason doubled down his throat, setting aside his high blood royalty, and let him be no kinsman to my liege. I do defy him, and I spit at him. I call him a slanderous coward and a villain. By all my hopes, most falsely doth he lie. Pale, trembling coward. There, I throw my gauge, disclaiming here the kinship of the king and laying aside my high blood's royalty, for it is fear, not reverence, that makes thee to accept. And if guilty dread hath left you any strength to pick up mine honor's pawn, then stoop. I take it up, and by that sword I swear, I'll answer thee in any fair degree, or chivalrous design of knightly trial. And when I mount, alive may I not light, if I be traitor or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? The words I say I will in battle prove. That Mowbray did eight thousand nobles receive in name of lending for your highness soldiers, the like of which he detained for lewd employments, like a traitor, an injurious villain. What's more and more I will prove. These treasons for these last 18 years upon this land stem from false Mowbray, as their only head and source. Further I say, and further will maintain against his bad self to make it good, that Mowbray did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death, and like an injurious coward, sluiced out his innocent soul through streams of blood, blood which like Abel's sacrifice calls to me for justice and rough chastisement. And by the glorious worth of my descent, this arm shall prove it, or my life be spent. <laughs> Ohio Pitch is resolution sword. Thomas of Norfolk, what sayest thou to this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf till I have told this slander of his blood how God and good men hate so foul a liar. Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears were he my brother. They are kingdom's heir, but he is but my father's brother's son. Now by my scepter's all I make a vow. Such neighbor nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege in, nor partialize the unstooping firmness of our upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray, as art thou, free speech and fearless, I to thee allow. Then Bolinbrook, as low as to thy heart, through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Now swallow down that lie. For Gloucester's death I slew him not. But to my own disgrace, disgrace, I neglected my sworn duty in that case. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honor of a father to my foe, once did I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received that sacrament, I did confess it and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest appealed, it issues from the rancor of a villain, a recreant, and a most degenerate traitor, which in myself I will boldly defend, interchangeably hurled down my gauge upon his overweening traitor's foot to prove myself a loyal gentleman, even in the best chambered of his bosom. In haste, most heartily I pray, your highness, to assign our trial day. This we prescribe, though no physician, deep malice makes too great incision. Forget, forgive, conclude, and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it begun. We'll call him the Duke of Norfolk, you your son. Be a make peace shall become my age. Throw down my son, the Duke of Norfolk's gage. And Norfolk throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid. There is no boot. 
Myself I throw thyself to thy foot. My life thou shalt your command, but not my shame. My, the one my duty owes, but not my fair name. I am disgraced, impeached, and baffled here, pierced to the soul with this slanted venom spear, the which no balm can cure, but his heart blood which breathes this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gauge. My dear, dear lord, the purest tre treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away men are but gilded loam or painted clay. Mine honor is my life. Both throw in one. Take honor from me, and my life is done. My honor, let me try. And that I live for, and that will I die. Cousin, throw down his gauge, do you begin? Oh, God defend me from such deep sin. Shall I be crestfallen in front of my father, or let pale beggar fear impeach my height by this outdared dastard? Ere my tongue should, should mar my honor with so little. We were not born to sue, but to command. Which, since we cannot do to make you friends, be ready, as your lives shall answer it. At Coventry, upon St. Lambert's Day, there shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate. Since we cannot atone you, we shall see justice design the victor's chivalry. Alas, the part I had in Gloucester's blood doth more solicit me than your exclaims to stir against the butchers of his life. What? Since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault we cannot correct, but we are quarreled to the will of heaven, who, when they see the hours ripe on earth, will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Hath love in thy old blood no living fire? Edward, seven sons, whereof thyself art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood. But Thomas, my dear lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root is cracked and all his precious liquor spilled by envy's hand and murder's bloody axe. What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life, the best way is to avenge my Gloucester's death. God is thy quarrel, for God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight, hath caused his death, which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where then, alas, may I complain myself? Since God, the widow's champion in defense. Why, then I will. Farewell, old gaunt. Thou goest to Coventry there to behold our cousin Hereford and Thel Mowbray's fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrong on Hereford's spear, that it may enter butcher Mowbray's breast. Farewell, old gaunt. Thou sometimes, brother's Wife with her companion grief must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. On pain of death, let none be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the list, except the officer and such, except the marshal and such officers directed to do, appointed to direct these fair designs. My lord marshal, I would kiss my king's ring and take my knee before my sovereign. Mowbray and myself are like two men about to undergo a weary pilgrimage. Give us our ceremonious leave and fond farewells of our several friends. The appellant in all duty greets your highness and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as the cause is just, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which if today thou shed lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. Let no noble eye profane a tear if I am gored by Mowbray's spear. My loving lord, I take my leave of you. And of you, my noble cousin O'Merle. And you.
the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate, add proof unto mine honor with your prayers, and let your words steal my lance's tip, that it may pierce Mowbray's waxen coat, furbishing again the name of John Agaunt, even in the lusty behavior of his son. God, in thy good cause, make thee prosperous. Be swift like lightning in the execution, and let thy blows doubly redoubled fall like amazing thunder on the cast of thy adverse pernicious enemy. <laughs> Rouse up thy youthful blood, be valiant, and live! Oh, ever God of fortune cast my lot, there lives or dies, true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage and embrace his golden, uncontrolled enfranchisement more than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with my ed with mine adversary. Farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valor, couched in thine eye. Order the trial, Marshal, and begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, receive thy sword, and God defend the right. Sound trumpets, and set forward. Combatants! Stay! The king hath thrown his warder down! Then lay by their helmets and their swords and both return back to their chairs again. Well, that our kingdom's earth would not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered. And for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds plowed up with neighbors' swords. Therefore we banish you, our territories. You, cousin of Hereford, upon pain of death, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regret our fair dominions, but tread the stranger path of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be. The same sun that warms you shall shine on me. Norfolk, for thee remains a heavier doom which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The slow, sly hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege and all, and look for from your highness' mouth a dearer merit, not so deep a maim as to be cast forth in the common air, have I deserved at your highness' hands. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English now I must forego. What is thy sentence then, but speechless death, which robs my tongue from breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate, after our sentence plaining comes too late. And thus I turn me from my country's light, to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God, that you shall never so help you truth and God, greet each other's loves in banishment, nor by advice of purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our lands. I swear. And I to keep all this. Since now our flesh is banished from this land, confess your treasons ere you fly this place. You have a long journey. Carry not the clogging burthen of a heavy soul. Oh, Bolingbrook, if ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life. Oh, I from heaven banish us from hence. But what thou art, God thou and I do know, and all too soon I fear. The king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray, save back to England, all the world's my way. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eye do I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banishment plucked four years away. Six frozen winters spent return with welcome home from banishment. So great a time in such a small word. Four lagging winters, four wanton springs, such as the breath of kings. <laughs> I, I thank my liege that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile. 
but little vantage shall I reap thereby, for ere the six years he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about, my oil-dried lamp and time-be-wasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burnt and done, and blindfold death hath let me see my son. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. Not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Thy word is current with him for my death, but dead a kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good report whereto thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why not justice seems thou now then to lower? Things sweet to taste prove indigestion sour. You urge me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger and not my child, to smooth his fault I should have been more mild. A partial slander sought I to avoid, and in the sentence my own life destroyed. Alas, I looked that some of you should say I was too strict to make mine own away. You gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell. And uncle bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. Cousin, farewell. What presence must not know from where you do remain? Let paper show. My lord, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land will let me by your side. To what purpose dost thou hoard thy words that thou returnst no greeting to thy friends? I have too few to take my leave of you when the tongue's office should be prodigal in the heavy dolor of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence. For a time. Joy being absent, grief is present for that time. What are six winters? They are quickly gone. To what in joy, to what in grief, one hour does seem his ten. Call it a travel thou takest for pleasure. Rather, every tedious stride shall but remind me how much of the world lies between me and the jewels I love. Go, oh, say that I sent thee forth to purchase honor and not the king exiled thee, or suppose devouring pestilence <laughs> hangs in our air, and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks it and sets it light. Come, come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. With English ground, farewell, sweet soil adieu. My mother and my nurse that carries me still. Where'er I roam, boast of this I can. Though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. <laughs> we did observe, now, cousin O'Murrow. Oh, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you do call him so, but to the next highway. And there I left him. And say, what store of... Uh, Parting tears were shed. Faith, none of me, except the northeast wind, which then blew bitterly against our faces, wakes the sleeping room, and so by chance did grace our hollow parting with a tear. And what said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. <laughs> <laughs> and for my heart disdained that my tongue should so profane the word, that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression of such grief that words seemed buried in my sorrow's grave. Mary, would the word farewell have lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment, he would have had a volume of farewells. But since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. But tis doubt when time will call him home from banishment, whether his kinsman comes to see his friends. <laughs> Ourselves, and bushy, bagged, and green here, did observe his courtship to the common people. Oh, how he did seek to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy. <laughs> What reverence he does throw away on slaves and wooing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles and a patient underbearing of his fortune as toward to banish their effects with him. Oh, off goes his bonnet to an oyster wedge. A brace of draymen bid God speed him well and had the tribute of his supple knee with, oh, thanks, good gentlemen, my loving friends. <laughs> as were our England in reversion his, and he our subjects next degree in hope. Well, he is gone. 
and with him go these thoughts. Now, for the rebels which stand out in Ireland, expedient manage must be made, my liege. We will ourselves in person to these wars, and for our coffers with liberal largesse and too great a court are grown something light, we are in force to farm our royal realm. The revenues whereof shall furnish us for our affairs at hand. That come short, our substitutes at home will have blank charters, whereto when they know what men are rich, shall subscribe to them for large sums of gold, which will be sent after us to supply our wants, for we must to Ireland presently. Was she? What news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord, suddenly taken, and has sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Where lies he? At Ely House. He gone. Put it in the physician's mind to help him to his grave immediately. <laughs> The linings of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray God we make haste and come too late. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Will the king come that I may breathe my last and wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth? Vex not yourself nor strive not with your breath. Oh. For all in vain comes counsel to his ear. They say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. The words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. The man that no more must say is listened more than those whom age and youth have taught to close. Oh, Richard, my life's counsel would not hear. My death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds as praises of whose taste the wise are fond, lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. Direct not him whose way himself will choose. Tis breath thou lackst, and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, <coughs> is now leased out as to a tenement or a pelting farm. England bound in by the triumphant sea whose rocky shores beat back the envious siege of watery Neptune is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds that England that was wont to conquer others has made a shameful conquest of itself. Oh, that the scandal vanish with my life. How happy then were my ensuing death. <laughs> the king is come, deal mildly with his youth, for young hot colts being raged to rage the more. How fares our noble uncle Lancaster? To what comfort, man? How is with aged gone? How that name befits my composition. <laughs> old gaunt indeed, and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat who is not gaunt? Sleeping England long time have I watched. Watching breeds leanness, and leanness is all gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave, gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits not but bones. Can sick men play so sweetly with their names? Misery makes sport to mock itself. 
since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. To die, men flatter those that live. No, no. Men living flatter those that die. Oh, thou now a dying sayest thou flatterest me. Oh no, thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health. Uh, I breathe. I, I see thee ill. He that, he that made me knows I see thee ill. And thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick. And thou, too careless patient that thou art, commits thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. <laughs> A thousand flatterers lie within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head. Would thy grandsire with a prophet's eye could see how his son's son should destroy his sons? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law, and thou and art thou, a lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on a uh, ague's privilege, darest with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from its native residence. <laughs> now, by my right royal majesty, wert thou not my father's brother's son? Great Edward, this tongue of yours, which runs so roundly in thy head, should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, hast thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused. My brother Gloucester, well-meaning soul, whom fair befallen heaven amongst happy souls may be a precedent and witness good that thou respectest not spilling Edward's blood. Join this present sickness that I have, and thy unkindness be like crooked age to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter, thy tormentors be. <coughs> Convey me to my bed and then to my grave. Love they to live that love and honor have. <coughs> and let them die that age and sullens have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave. I, I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life and holds you dear as Harry, Duke of Hereford, were he here. Right. You say true. As Hereford's love, so his, and as theirs, so mine. And all be as it is. Age, old gaunt, commends him to your majesty. What says he? Nay, nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life, and all old Lancaster hath spent. Be York the next that must be bankrupt so. Though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be. So much for that. <laughs> now for these Irish wars and for these great affairs do ask some charge towards our assistance. We seize unto us the plate, goods, revenues, and movables whereof our uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Ah, oh, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, not Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace have ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion raged more fierce, in peace was never gentle lamb more mild than was that young and princely gentleman. His face thou hast, for even so looked he, accomplished with the number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French, 
and not against his friends. His noble hand did well what he did spend, and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his king. Oh, Richard, y y York is too far gone with grief, or, or else he never would compare between. <laughs> Why, uncle, what's the matter? Oh, my liege, pardon me, if you please. If not, I, pleased not to be pardoned, am content with all. Seek you to seize and grip into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford? Is not God dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not God just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away, and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow, then ensue today. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king, but by fair sequence and succession? Now, afore God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head. You lose a thousand well-disposed hearts and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honour and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will. He sees into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. I'll not be by the while. My liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof, there's none can tell. But by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. Well, she repaired the Earl of Wiltshire straight, bid him repair to Ely House to see this business. But tomorrow next we will for Ireland, and tis time, I trow, in our absence, we do create a. Uh, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England. He is just and always loved us well. Queen, come. Tomorrow once we part, be merry, for our time of stay is short. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living too, for now his son is Duke. And barely entitled. Rich, in richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great. It must break with silence ere it be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him never speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Since that thou wouldst speak to the Duke of Hereford, if it be so, out with the boldly man, quick as mine ear to hear a good towards him. Ah, no good that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gilded of his patrimony. Now, for God, tis shame, such wrongs are born in him, of royal prince and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers, and what they will inform merely in hate against any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. <laughs> the commons hath he filled with grievous taxes. The nobles hath he fined with these ancient quarrels, and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised, as blanks, benevolences, and I what not what. But what God's name doth become of this? Wars hath not wasted it, for ward he hath not, but <laughs> basely yielded upon compromise that which his noble ancestors achieved with blows. <laughs> More hath he spent in peace than they in wars. <laughs> the Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm and farm. The king's grown bankrupt, like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hangeth over him. He hath not money for these Irish wars. His birth and is with taxes notwithstanding, but by robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king. Mm -hmm. But lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet see no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the wind. Sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not. 
but securely perish. We see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now for suffering so the causes of our wreck. Nay, not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death, I spy life peering. But I dare not say how near the tiding of our comforts is. Nay, nay, <laughs> let us share our thoughts as thou dost ours. Ah, be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyselves in speaking so. Thy words are but as thoughts, therefore be bold. And thus I have from Port Leblanc, a bay in Brittany, received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold Lord Cobham, Thomas, son and heir to the Earl of Arundel, that late broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother, Archbishop Wright of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir John Ramston, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton, and Francis Coyne, all these well furnished by the Duke of Brittany with eight tall ships, three thousand men of war, are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they had ere this, but that they stay the first departing of the king for Ireland, if then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken palm the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself away, in post with me to Ravensburg. If you faint as fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. To horse, to horse, urged out from them that fear. Hold out my horse, and I will first be there. <laughs> Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life, harming, heaviness, and entertain a cheerful disposition. Cannot be but sad, such a heavy sad, as though thinking on no thought, I think, makes me heavy with nothing, faint and shrink. God save your majesty, and well met, sir. I hope the king hath not yet shipped for Ireland. Wherefore hope so? For, for his designs crave haste, and his haste is good hope. Wherefore hope he has not shipped? That he, our hope, might have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope that strongly hath set footing in the land. The banished Bolingbroke doth repeal himself, and with uplifted arms is straight arrived from Ravensborough. God in heavens forbid. Ah, madam, tis too true, and that is worse, the Lord Northumberland, his son, young Henry Percy, the Lords of Ross, Beaumont, and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have, whereupon the Earl of Worcester had broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. Green, thou art midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my dismal sorrow's heir. And I, a gasping new mother, delivered woe to woe, sorrow to sorrow joined. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair and be at enmity with cozying hope. He is a flatterer, a parasite, a keeper back at death, which gently dissolves the band at life, in which false hope lingers in extremities. Here comes the Duke of York. Uncle, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comfort's in heaven, and we are on the earth where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he's gone to save far off, whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I, left to underprop his lands, who, weak with age, cannot support myself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. My lord, your son was gone before I came. He was? Why so, go all which way it will. The nobles, they are fled. The commons, they are cold. And will I fear revolt on Hereford's side? Sirrah, get thee to Plashy to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pound. Hold, take my ring. My lord. I forgot to tell your lordship, today, as I came by, I called there, but I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is knave? An hour before I came, 
The Duchess died. God for his mercy. What a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I, I know not what to do. Would to God the king had cut off my head with my brothers. What, are there no posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I would say, pray pardon me. Uh, Go, fellow, get thee home, provide some carts, and bring away the armour that is there. Gentlemen, will you go, muster men? If, if I know how or which way to order these affairs thus thrust disorderly into my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen. The one is, is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. The other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men and meet me presently at Barclay. The wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportional to, be, to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. And that's the wavering commons, for their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them by so much fills their heart with deadly hate, wherein the king stands generally condemned. Well, I will for refuge straight to Wiltshire Castle. The Earl of Bristol is already there. Well, thither will I with you. For little office will the hateful commons perform for us except like curs to tear us all to pieces. How far, my lord, is it to Barclay now? Oh, believe me, noble lord, I'm a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high wild hills and rough uneven ways draws out our miles and makes them wearisome, but and yet your fair discourse hath been as sugar, making the heart way sweet and delectable. Of much greater value than my company are your kind words. <laughs> uh, but who comes here? It is my son, young Harry Percy. I tender you my service, my gracious lord, such as it is, being tender, raw, and young, till elder years shall ripen and confirm to more approved service and desert. We thank you, gentle Percy, and be sure in nothing else are we as happy as in a soul remembering his friends. And as our fortune ripens with your love, it is your love and labor's recompense. My heart makes this covenant. My hand thus seals it. How far is it to Barclay, and what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? Uh, there stands the castle behind yon tuft of trees, manned with three hundred men of war, as I have heard. In it are the lords of York, Barclay, and Seymour, none else of name or noble estimate. Here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Welcome, my lords. I want your love pursues a banished traitor. My treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, but as it grows, it shall be your recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. And far some out our labor to obtain it. Evermore thanks the exchequer of the poor, which, until my infant fortune comes to years, must stand in for its bounty. But who comes here? Why, it is his grace himself, my noble uncle. Oh, show me thy humble heart, and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. Gracious uncle. Tut, tut. Grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle. And that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more why, why have they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom? Frighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms. Come.
canst thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy! The king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Were I but now the lord of such hot youth, as when brave Gaunt, thy father and myself, rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men, from forth the rank of many thousand French, oh, then how quickly should this arm of mine now, prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee, and minister correction to thy fault. My gracious uncle, let me know my fault, on what condition it stands and wherein. Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason, thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford, and now I come, I come for Lancaster. My noble uncle, I beseech your grace to look upon my fault with an indifferent eye. You are my father, for methinks I see old Gaunt alive again in you. Oh, then, my father, will you permit that I stand condemned a wandering vagabond, my rights and royalties plucked from my arms perforce and given to upstart on thrifts? Wherefore was I born? If my cousin king be king of England, then it must be that I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, my noble cousin Omer, and had you first died and he been thus trod down, he would have found in his uncle Gaunt a father to rouse his wrongs and run them to the bay. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are all a misemploy. What would you have me do? I am a subject. I challenge law and am denied attorneys. Therefore, I personally lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. It stands your grace upon to do him right. Base men by his endowment are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feelings of my cousin's wrongs and labored all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver and cut out his way to find out right with wrong, it may not be. And you that do abet him in this kind, cherish rebellion, and are rebels all. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own, for the right of which we have all strongly sworn to give him aid, and let him never see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known to you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well. Unless you please to enter in the castle and there repose you for this night? An offer, uncle, that we will accept. But first we must win you to come with us to Bristol, which is held by Bushy and Green and their accomplices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth that I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It may be I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Hmm? nor friends, nor foes. To me, welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. My Lord of Salisbury, 
We have stayed 10 days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we have no tidings from the king. Therefore, we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Oh, stay, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all of his confidence in thee. I say the king is dead. He will not stay. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled. As our assured Richard, their king, is dead. Richard, with eyes of heavy mind, I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. Bring forth these men. Bushy and green, I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must depart your bodies with urgings against your pernicious lives, for tis no charity. Yet, in front of these men, I will wash my hands of your deaths by unfolding some of the reasons for your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and lineaments by you, unhappy and disfigured clean. In a manner of your sinful hours, you have caused a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broken the possession of a royal bed, and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears brought forth from her eyes by your foul deeds. Myself, a prince by fortune of my birth, and near to the king in blood and near in love until you made him misinterpret me, have breathed my English breath into foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment, whilst you fed upon my seigneuries, disparked my parks, felled my forest woods, from my own windows tore my household coat, raised my imprice, leaving me with no proof but man's opinions and my living blood to show the world that I am a gentleman. For this, more than this, much more than twice all this, thou art condemned to die. See them delivered to execution in the hand of death. More welcome is a stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lords, farewell. My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My lord, Northumberland, see them dispatched. Uncle. You say the queen is at your house. In God's name, fairly let her be entreated. Send her my kind commends, and take special care my message be delivered. A gentleman of mine I have dispatched with letters of your love to her at large. Thanks, uncle. My lords, we must away to fight with Glendower and his accomplices. A while to work, and then after holiday. Barclay Castle, call you this at hand. Yea, my good lord, how brooks your grace the air after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Must I like it well? I weep for joy to stand upon my earth again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hands. The rebels wound thee with thy horse's hoofs, and like a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles at meeting so Weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favors with my royal hands. <laughs> Feed not thy sovereign enemies, my earth, nor with thy sweets comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated toads lie in their way, and when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder, whose double tongue may with a wardle touch throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. <laughs> Mock not my senseless conjurations, lords. This earth shall have a failing, and these stones prove armed soldiers ere her native king falter under foul rebellion's arms. Fear not, my lord. The power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. The means that heaven yields must be embraced and not neglected, else, if heaven would and we will not, 
Husband's offer we refuse, the proffered means of succor and redress. He means, my lord, that we are to remiss, while Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong and great. This comfortable cousin. Knowest thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage bloody here. But when from end this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his lightning in every guilty hole and murders, treasons, and detested sin, the pluck of night plucked from off their back stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. Then this thief, this traitor, <laughs> Bolingbroke, who all this while hath reveled in the night, whilst we were wandering in the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne. The East, his treasons, will sit blushing in his face, unable to endure the night of day, but self-affrighted, tremble at themselves. Not all the water of the rough rude sea can wash the balm off an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For all the men at Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown. God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. And when angels fight, these men must fall. For God still defends the right. Welcome, my Lord. How far off lies your power? Nor near nor further off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bids me speak nothing but despair. One day, too late, I fear me, and not my noble lord hath clouded thy happy days on earth. Bid time return, call back yesterday, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. But today, today, unhappy day hath overthrown thy joys, thy friends, thy fortunes, and thy state. For the Welshmen, hearing thou were dead, <laughs> have gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort! My liege, why look sugar is so pale? But now the blood of 20,000 men did triumph in my face, and they are fled. Till some such blood come hither again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All those that would be safe fly from my side, for time hath set a blot upon my bride. Comfort, my liege, remember who you are. I had forgot myself. Am I not king? <laughs> Awake, thou slug of majesty, thou sleepest. Is not the king's name? Forty thousand names. <laughs> arm, arm, my name, a puny subject, strikes at thy great glory. Look not at the ground, ye favorites of the king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? More health and happiness betide, my liege, than can my care tune tongue deliver him. Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Saves my kingdom lost. Why trust my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Strives Bolingbroke to be as great as we, greater he shall not be if he serve God. Glad am I that your majesty is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity, like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores, as if the world were all dissolved to tears, so High above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land with hard bright steel and hearts harder than steel. Whitebeards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty. Boys with women's voices strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff unwieldy arms against thy crown. The very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal you against thy state. Yea, distaff women, manage rusty bills against thy seat. Both young and old rebel, and all goes worse than I have power to tell. How well, how well, thou tellest the tale so ill. Where's the Earl of Wiltshire? 
Where is Baggett? What has become of Bushy? Where is Green? <laughs> they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps. If we prevail, their heads shall answer for it. I warrant they have made peace with Bolingbrook. Peace have they made with him indeed. Villains, vipers, damned without redemption, dogs easily want to fall on any man. Again, uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Are Bushy, Green, and the Earl of Wiltshire dead? Aye, all of them at Bristol lost their heads. Where lies my father, the Duke with his power? No matter where. Of comfort, no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. <laughs> Let's choose executors and talk of wills, and yet not so. For what can we bequeath except our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lives, our lands, and all our bawling brooks. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How oh, some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts of those they did depose, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his seat. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a, a breath, a little scene. The monarch eyes he feared kill with looks, suffusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh, which walls about our life, were brass impregnable. And humored thus, comes at the last with a little pin pours through his castle wall, and farewell, king. Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away tradition, respect, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook all this while. I live with bread, like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends, Subjected thus, how can you say to me that I am king? My lord, wise men ne'er wail their woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail. My father has a power. Inquire of him, learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chidest me well. Bolingbroke, I come to change blows with thee till our day of doom. Say, Scroop, where lies our uncle with his power? Speak, sweetly man, although thy looks be sour. Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state and inclination of the day. So may you, by my dull and heavy eye, my tongue hath but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer, my small and small to lengthen out the worst that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. Yeah, said enough. What say you now? What comfort have we now? By heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly that bids me be of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle, there I'll pine away. A king, woe slave, shall kingly woe obey. My liege, a he word. He does me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers. Let them hence away. From Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day.
so that by this intelligence we learn the Welshmen are dispersed, and Salisbury has gone to meet with the king, who lately, with some private friends, has landed on the coast. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hit his head. It would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say King Richard. Alack, the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes, merely to be brief left I his title out. The time hath been, would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake. The heavens are o'er our heads. This I know, and seek not to oppose myself against their will. But who comes here? <laughs> Welcome, Harry. Is, will not this castle yield? The castle royally, my lord, is manned against thy entrance. Royally? Why? It contains no king. Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon lime and stone. And with him are the Lord O'Merle, uh, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a, a clergyman of holy reverence who I cannot learn. Oh, belike tis the Bishop of Carlisle. My noble lords, go to the rude ribs of this ancient castle, and through the brazen trumpet send the breath of parley to his ruined ears exclaiming thus, that Henry Bolingbroke is on both his knees to kiss King Richard's ring, bringing allegiance and true faith of heart. Come hither, even to his very feet, to lay down my arms and power, provided my banishment repealed, and lands returned are given freely. And if not, I'll use the advantage of my power to lay the summer's dust with streams of blood that rain from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. Go, signify as much while here we march. Methinks the king and I should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water when they meet with thundering shock and tear the cheek of heaven. Let him be the fire and all the yielding water be. Let the rage be his, and I'll rain my waters down upon the earth, on the earth, but not on him. Come, march here, and mark King Richard how he looks. We are amazed. And thus long hath we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know that no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our scepter unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls and turned them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, but know that my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot that lift thy vassal hands against our throne and threat the precious glory of our state. The king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin Harry Bolingbroke doth humbly kiss thy hand, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which upon thy royal party granted once, his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stable, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince, is just. And as I am a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland, say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither. The fair number of his demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. 
with what gracious utterance thou hast, convey to his gentle hearing kind commends. We do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not? To look so poorly and speak so fair. Shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor and so die? Nay, my lord, let some fight with gentle words till time lends friends and friends their helpful swords. Oh, God. Oh, God. That ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief or lesser than my name. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? For God's sake, let it go. <laughs> I'll change my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, and my large kingdom for... A little grave, a little, a little grave, an obscure grave. <coughs> oh, Merle, my tender-hearted cousin, thou weepest. We'll make foul weather with despised <coughs> tears. No, our sighs and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolting land. Most mighty prince, Lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Shall he give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a boot, and Bolingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth attend. In the base court. Base court, where kings grow base, to come at traitors' calls and do them grace. Stand all apart and give his royal majesty his due, my gracious lord. You do debase your princely knee by making the base earth proud with kissing it. You may rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eyes see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, this high, I know, although your knee be low. My gracious lord, I cover for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all? Only so far, my most redoubted lord, as in doing good service, I deserve your love. Oh, thou hast well deserved. They well deserve to have that knowest the strongest and surest way to get. Oh, good uncle, <laughs> give me your hands. Nay, you dry your tears. Tears show their love, but want their remedy, huh? Cousin, I am too young to be your father, but you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willingly too, for do we must, what force will have us do. Set on towards London, cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. Call forth Ross. Now, Ross, speak freely what thou dost know about the Duke of Gloucester's death. Who hath wrought it with the king, and who hath performed the bloody office of his timeless end? Then bring before my face the Lord of Merle. Stand forth, cousin, and look upon this man. My Lord of Merle. I know your daring tongue scorns to unsay what it once hath delivered. In that dead time when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, Is my arm not of length to reach beyond the restful English court, as far as Calais to mine uncle's head? Amongst much other talk, that very time, I heard you say that you had rather refused the offer of a hundred thousand crowns than brawling books return to England, adding withal how blessed this land would be in this your cousin's death. Here's my gauge. The manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell. I say.
say, thou liest, and will maintain what thou hast said is false in thy heart blood, though all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword. Fold, Ross, forbear. Thou shalt not pick it up. There is my gauge engaged to thine. I heard thee say, O moral, and bothily spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest it twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart, where it was forged with my rapier's point. Thou darest not, coward, live to see that day. Now by my soul, I would word this hour. Will it be? <laughs> thou art dared to hell for this. O Merle, thou liest. He is as true in this appeal as thou art all unjust. And as thou art so, there I throw my gauge to prove on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it, if thou darest. Who sets me else? By heaven, I will throw it all. I have a thousand spirits in my breast to answer twenty thousand such as you. All your differences shall rest under gauge until we assign your days of trial. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume-plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts the heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, fourth of that name. God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Mary, God forbid! <laughs> what subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here who is not Richard's subject? And shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy-elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath and himself? Not present? Oh, forfended God, that in a Christian climate, souls were fine to show so heinous, obscene, black a deed. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks. Spurred on by God, thus boldly for his king, my lord of Hereford, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to Hereford's king, and if you crown him, let me prophesy. The blood of English shall manure the ground, and future ages groan for this foul act. Prevent it, resist it, let it not be so, that child, child's children, call against you, woe! Well, have you argued, sir, and for your pains of Capital treason, we arrest you here. <laughs> Shall it please the lords to hear the commons suit? Go, fetch Richard that he might in public view surrender so we can proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. You lords that are here under our arrest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholden to your loves and little look to for a helping hand. Alack, why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reign? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee. Did sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission? Yet well I remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometimes cry, all hail to me? God save the king. Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king. Though I be not he. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer. The resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Here, cousin, 
sees the crowd. Yeah, cousin. On this side, my head, and on that side, and thine. Now is this golden crown like a deep well, owing two buckets ever filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen, and full of water. That bucket down, full of tears, am I drinking my griefs whilst thou ride up on high? I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but my griefs are mine. My glory and my state you may depose, but not my griefs. Still I am king of those. Are you content to resign the crown? I? No. No. I. For I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no. For I resign to thee. Mark now how I will undo myself. I take this heavy weight from off my head, this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears, I wash away my balm. With mine own hand, give away my crown. With mine own tongue, deny my sacred state. With mine own breath, release all duteous oaths, all pomp, and majesty I do forswear. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit. And soon lie Richard in an earthly pit. God save King Harry, the young king Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? No more but that you read o'er these accusations and grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and prophet of this land, that by confessing them the souls of men may deem thou art worthily deposed. Must I do so? Must I ravel out my weaved up follies? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offenses were on record, would not shame thee to read a lecture of them in so fair a truth. If thou wouldst, thou shouldst find one heinous article, containing the deposing of a king, cracking the strong warrant of an oath, marked with a blot, damned in the book of heaven. Uh, my lord, dispatch. Read o'er the article. Oh, my eyes are full of tears. I cannot see. Yet salt water blinds them not so much, but they can see a sort of traitors here. Yet if I turn my eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest, for I have given my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king, who made glory base and sovereignty a slave, proud majesty, a subject, state, a peasant. My lord. No, lord of thine, thou hot, insulting man. No. Nor no man's glory. I have no name, no title. A good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. Yet if my word be sterling here in England, let it command a mirror hither straight, that I may see what a face I have now that it is bankrupt of his majesty. Sub, go fetch a looking glass. Read over the paper while the glass doth come. Fiend, thou tormentest me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, my lord Northumberland. Commons will not then be satisfied. Be satisfied. I will read enough where I see the very book wherein all my sins are writ, and that's myself. Give me the glass. Therein will I read. No deeper wrinkles yet. Hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and left no deeper wounds? This is beguiling glass. Thou dost flatter me, like my followers in prosperity. Thou dost beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under one household roof did keep ten thousand men? Was this the face that like the sun did make beholders wink? Was this the face that outfaced so many follies, only to be 
outfaced by Bolingbroke? A brittle glory shineth in the face, as brittle as the glory is the face. A big one boon, and then be gone and trouble you no further, shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin. I am greater than a king, for when I was king, all my flatterers were but my subjects. Now that I am a subject, I have a king for my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. You give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will, so that I were from your sight. Go. Some of you convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Conveyors are you all. Rise nimbly from a true king's fall. On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. A woeful pageant have we witnessed here. The woes to come, the children yet unborn, shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. Clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow, your eyes of tears. Come with me to supper, and I'll lay. A plot shall show us all a merry day. Let us rest here if this rebellious earth have any resting place for her true king's queen. Oh. Thou art the model where the old Troy did stand. Why should hard favored grief be lodged in thee? Join not with grief. Fair woman, do not so. Make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream. From which awake to the truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn brother sweet to grim necessity, and he and I shall keep a league till death. Is my Richard in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbroke disposed of thine intellect? Hath he been in thine heart? The lion, dying, thrust forth his paw to wound the earth with nothing else but with rage to be overpowered. And wilt thou, pupil-like, take thy corrections mildly? Kiss the rod and fawn on rage with base humility when thou art a lion and a king of beasts. King of beasts, indeed. If aught but beast, I had still been happy king of men. Good sometime queen, prepare thee hence for friends. Think that I am dead, and that even here thou takest as from the, my deathbed, thy last loving leave. In winter's tedious nights, sit by the fire and tell thou the lamentable tale of me, and send the hearers weeping to their beds for the deposing of a rightful king. My lord, there is order taken for you. The mind of Bolingbroke has changed. You must unto Pomfret, not unto the tower. And madam, there's order for you. You must with all swift speed away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder, where with all the proud Bolingbroke ascends my throne. The time shall not be many hours more than it is, ere foul sin, gathering head, shall break into corruption. Or thou shalt think, the, though he divide the kingdom and give thee half, it is too little, helping him to all. And he shall think that thou, that knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, shall know again, being ne'er so little urged, the way to pluck him headlong from the throne. The love of wicked friends converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on my head, and there's an end. Take leave and part, for part you must forthwith. No. Doubly divorced, bad men. You violated twofold marriage. 
Betwixt my throne and me, and not betwixt me and my married wife. Must we be divided? Must we part? I, hand from hand, my love and heart from heart. Banish us both. Send the king with me. There was some love, but little policy. Whither he go, thither let me go. So two together weeping make one woe. Go weep thou for me in France, I for thee here. Better far off than near be near the near go. Count thy ways with sighs, I mine with groans. So the longest way shall have the longest moan. Go in weeping sorrow, let's be brief. For in wedding it there is such length in grief. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part. Thus we give thy mine and take from thee thy heart. Give me mine own again. Twere no good of thee to keep and kill thine heart. We make woe wanton her disfondelay. Therefore, once again, adieu. The rest let sorrow say. Lord, you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke, great Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, which his aspiring rider seemed to know with slow but stately pace kept on his course whilst all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke! Alack! Whilst he, uh. from the one side to the other turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countrymen. Alack, poor Richard! Where rode he the whilst? No joyful tongue gave him his welcome home, but dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off, his face still combating with tears and smiles the badges of his grief and patience. But had not God for some strong purpose steeled the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted Barbarism itself had pitied him. Mm. To Bolingbroke we are sworn subjects now, whose state and honour I for I allow. Here comes my son O'Merle. O'Merle that was. But that is lost for being Richard's friend, and madam, you must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the new-come spring? Good madam, I know not. God knows I would as lief be none as one. Well, bear you well in this new spring of time lest you be cropped before you come to prime. <clears throat> what news from Oxford? Hold those justs and triumphs? For aught I know, my lord, they do. You will be there, I know. God prevent it not, I purpose so. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, looks thou pale? Let me see the writing. My lord, I would not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. It is a matter of small consequence, and for some reasons I would not have it seen. For some reasons, sir, I mean to see. I fear. I fear. Oh, 
What should you fear? Tis nothing but some bond that he has entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day. Boy, let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace, I would not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see it, I say. Treason. Foul. Treason. Villain. Traitor. Slave. What is the matter, my lord? God for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why, what is it, my lord? Now, by mine honour, by my life, by my troth, I will impeach the villain. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace. What is the matter, O Merle? Blessed mother, be contented is nothing other than what my poor life must answer. Thy life answer? Why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Uh, have we more sons? Or are we like to have? Uh, and wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age and rob me of a happy mother's name? I is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou bad, fond woman! Wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here have ta'en the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. Then what is that to him? Away, fond woman! Were he twenty times my son, I would appeach him. Hadst thou groaned for him, as I have done, thou wouldst be more pitiful. But now I know thy mind. Thou dost suspect I have been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard, not thy son. Sweet York, sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be, not like to me or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman. After O Merle, mount thee upon his horse, spur post and get before him to the king, and beg thy pardon ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be long behind, though I be old, and never will I rise up from the ground till Bolingbroke have pardoned thee. Tell me of my unthrifty son. It has been three full months since I did see his face. If any plague hangs over us, tis he. I would to God, my lord, he might be found. Inquire in London at the taverns there, where it is said he daily doth frequent with loose and unrestrained companions. Those, they say, that wait in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers. Wanton youth and effeminate boy takes it as a point of honor to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, uh, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of these triumphs held at Oxford. What said the gallant? His answer was, he would unto the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favor, and with that he would... <clears throat> Unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute as desperate. Ha! <laughs> and yet, through both I see some sparks of better hope that elder years may happily bring about. <laughs> uh, who comes here? A uh, cousin! Why stare you and look so wildly? God save your grace. I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Withdraw yourself and leave us here alone. What's the matter with my cousin now? Forever. May my knee grow to the ground, my tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth, unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault. If the first, ere heinous it be, to win thy after love, I pardon thee. My liege, beware! Look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy presence there. Villain, I'll make thee sick. Say, thou revengeful hand, thou hast no cause to fear. 
Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? What's the matter, uncle? Speak. Gather your breath and tell us how near this danger is that we may arm us against it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt see the treason that my haste forbids me speak. Remember, as thou reach thy promise pass, read not my name there, my heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain, and thy hand did set it down. I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear and not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to the heart. Brave, strong, bold conspiracy. <laughs> o oh, loyal father of a traitorous son, thy good doth overflow into the bad, and thy abundant good excuses this deadly blot in thy digressing son. Mine honor lives when his dishonor dies, or my shamed life in his dishonor lies. Thou killst me in his life, giving him breath. The traitor lives, the true man's put to death. O oh, king, believe not this hard-hearted man. Blood loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall they old dunks once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, sweet husband, be patient. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good aunt. Not yet, I thee beseech. Forever will I walk upon my knees and never see day that the happy sees till thou give joy, until thou bid me joy by pardoning Rutland my transgressing boy. Until my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Against them both my true joints bended be. Ill mayst thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Pleads he in earnest, look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears, his prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all beside. Good aunt, stand up. No, do not say stand up. Say pardon first and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach, pardon would be the first word of thy speech. I never longed to hear a word till now. Say pardon, king. Let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouths so meet. Good aunt, stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him as God shall pardon me. happy vantage of the kneeling knee. But as for our brother-in-law, the abbot, and the rest of their confederacy, straight destruction shall dog their heels. Uncle, help to order some powers to Oxford, or where'er they are. They shall not live upon this world. I will have them if I but know where. Uncle, farewell. And cousin, adieu. Well hath your mother prayed and proved you true. <laughs> Come, my old son, I pray God make thee new. Didst thou not mark the king, what words he spake? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? Those were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he? He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wistly looked on me, and who would say, I would thou wert the man, 
that would deliver, that would divorce me from this terror. Meaning the king at Pomfret. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend and will rid his foe. I have been studying how I might compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous and here lives not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. And I'll hammer it out. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's fools. And that thought, and that thought they find a kind of ease bearing their misfortune on the backs of some such as have gone before. Thus play I and one person, many people, and none contented. Sometimes I think I am a king, and treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. And then crushing penury persuades me I were better than a king. And so I am kinged again, and by and by, unkinged by Bolingbroke. I have wasted time, and now time doth waste me, for he hath made me his numbering clock. Now, sir, the sounds that tell what hour it is are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart, which is the bell. Sighs, tears, and groans are minutes, times, and hours. And my time runs posting on in Bolingbroke's proud joy while I stand here Fooling his jack of the clock. My lord, will it please you to keep to? Taste of it first, as thou art wont to do. My lord, I cannot. Sir Pierce of Exon, who lately came for the king, hath forbidden it. The devil take Henry of Lancaster and patience is. Stale, and I'm a weary of it. I'm help! 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 Here! 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 How now? What means death in this rude assault? Here! No! Get it. No! Thine own hand yields thy death's instrument. Go. Fill another room in hell. That hand shall burn and never quench in fire that staggers thus my person. Exton, with thine own hand, with the king's blood, thou hast stained the king's own land. <coughs> mount, mount, my soul, thy seat is up on high, while thy gross flesh sinks downward. Here's the devil. As full of valor as of royal blood, both have I spilled. Oh, would the deed were good, for now the devil that told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest and give them burial here. My lords, what is the news? First to thy sacred state wish I all happiness. The next news is I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salisbury, Blunt, and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear at large discourse in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains and to thy worth. We'll add right worthy gains. My lord, I have from Oxford sent to London the head of Brockus and Sir Bennet Seely. Two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains, Willoughby, will not be forgot. Right worthy is thy merit, well I wot. 
the grand conspirator of this dark deed with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, I here bring forth and set before the king. For here is Carlisle living to abide thy kingly justice and sentence of his pride. Carlisle, this is your doom. Find out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it joy of life. For as thou lives in peace, die free from strife. Though mine enemy hast thou always been, high sparks of honor in you have I seen. Great king, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Extant, I thank thee not. Thou hast wrought slander with thy fatal hand upon mine head and on this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love Poison not, that do poison need, nor do I thee. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer, love him murdering. Take this guilt of conscience for thy labor, and not my good ward, nor princely favor. My lords, my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle on me and make me grow. Come. Mourn with me to what I do lament, and put on sullen black incontinent. I'll make a journey to the Holy Land to, to wash this blood from off my guilty hands. March sadly after, grace my mornings here with weeping after this untimely beer. <laughs> said at the outset, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. It is only by your good grace that we got to make it to 11 shows, 11 Shakespeare productions. We're so, so happy. But like Richard's Irish Wars, we love doing this for free, but it doesn't quite fund itself. We do have a few expenses that we deal with every year. So anything that you could offer uh, here would be greatly appreciated. We thank you so, so, so much for coming.